Good afternoon and welcome to the AI webinar Europe's Missile Defense, European Union and NATO. My name is Alessandro Marrone, Head of Defense Program at AI, and I will moderate the whole event. I'm glad to give immediately the floor for a first introduction to General Vincenzo Campurini, AI Scientific Advisor and former Italian Chief of Defense. And so the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you for involving me in this uh, very interesting uh, webinar uh, where we will uh, hear uh, many considerations on a very critical issue, the issue of missile defense for Europe. Uh, it is my real pleasure to welcome all of you uh, in this initiative taken by the Istituto Affari Internazionali uh, with the cooperation of several friends, uh, uh, including uh, industrial friends uh, from Leonardo. And it is uh, uh, my real pleasure to do so because uh, this subject, uh, which uh, seems to be uh, only limited to uh, a number of specialist uh, strategists, but uh, not related to uh, a real interest by the whole, uh, uh, the whole of the uh, possible audience in our public opinion, uh, I believe is in, on the contrary, extremely critical. And uh, uh, I had uh, the confirmation of my belief uh, only a few days ago when I participated in a similar event in a webinar organized by the um, European Leadership Network, uh, talking about the relationship between Russia and the US. Uh, well, don't be, uh, don't be mis uh, misguided by this, uh, this title because the point is that we, they were discussing, we were discussing the issue of the relationship which is uh, severely, severely um, uh, contaminated by uh, the issue of missile defense in Europe. Uh, Russia perceives uh, the missile system uh, uh, defense in Europe, uh, uh, which has been put into place, in place, uh, uh, a real threat. Uh, and uh, because they believe that uh, the aim of the system is uh, uh, of diminishing the real capability uh, of deterrence from Russia. Uh, I cannot help uh, considering that uh, uh, an European initiative in this field would in a way help uh, dissipate this type of feelings. Because uh, um, if we are able to deploy, to, to define, to develop uh, and deploy a European system, uh, no one can have any doubt that this is done in order to protect our territory from uh, possible uh, missile attacks uh, coming from uh, uh, rogue countries, uh, which are very uh, numerous in our environment. And uh, this is not aimed at in any way uh, reducing the strategic capability of Russia. So if Russia perceives uh, uh, that uh, the missile defense of Europe is a threat, a European missile defense uh, will not be considered a threat. Therefore, I believe that uh, if we are able uh, technically, scientifically and operationally uh, to uh, develop such a system uh, to protect our population, our cities, our countries, uh, this will also be a, a very good, uh, political instrument in order to alleviate uh, the uh, confrontation which we are facing today and which in a way is uh, um, uh, troubling our, our, our future. Uh, that's why I believe that the, the uh, IAI initiative is very timely uh, and can be the right incentive to our uh, industrial environment in order to uh, develop something which is uh, uh, operationally uh, uh, wise, uh, capable, uh, and also politically viable. Uh, having said that, uh, I, it is my real pleasure to give the floor to General Graziano, uh, 
very good old friend of mine uh, with whom we shared uh, very interesting moments in our careers in different positions and uh, who is now responsible for chairing uh, the uh, military committee in the European Union uh, in a way uh, in the position capable of pointing uh, the attention and the direction of our political masters into the right direction. Uh, Claudio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you, to all the panelists. And particularly, let me start thanking uh, my dear friend Vincenzo Camporini, also my master of my child when I was uh, a younger officer, after that we had many uh, occasions to to share the life and the thinking together. Thank you. Thank you for Michele and Ones, to the young and all the uh, distinguished panelists for organizing this discussion that is a great opportunity to focus on one vital common defense capability. Uh, and I will start by saying that the first meeting of the European Security Forum on the 2nd of April 2001 was devoted to the issue of missile defense. 20 years later, missile defense is a particularly time urgent and important topic in terms of the European interest. And being the highest military authority in the European Union institution, I can bluntly affirm that the pandemic brought new threats, but at the same time, has amplified the relevance of the conventional ones with uncertainty and challenges that cannot be taken solely by diplomatic means. These considerations are closely related to the importance of the paper edited by Alessandro Marrone and Carolina Muti, because the change in strategy and reality has implication for the deployment of missile defenses. It is no longer obvious that limited missile defense system deployed to address strategic threats would have the same consequences that we saw during, at this point, uh, the very far away time of the Cold War. Today, the perceived missile threat does not stem only from Russia, but from countries such as North Korea and Iran, and recently I was in the Republic of Korea, I understood also in that part of the world how much is important this discussion about uh, the missile defense and the new threats that are coming uh, from different uh, relevant actors. And we have also uh, Indo-Pacific strategies that are making even more relevant for European Union. Furthermore, it is known the actual potential threat posed by China. It is also known that over the next decade, Beijing will expand its long range missile capabilities. It's important to underline that the spectrum of threats on the European territory is evolving toward a more complex and evolving scenario. This, combined with the new disruptive technologies that are now entering service, such as hypersonic weapons, still represent the threats to our common security. European defense actors should place priority in this decade on the development of missile defense system. The next generation interceptor project provides a unique opportunity for Europeans to converge their efforts in the field of missile defense and to secure sovereignty in, a, in an area vital to their strategic autonomy. Now, a clear stated in the paper, six member states are cooperating on the timely warning and interception with space-based threat uh, theater, surveillance at that so-called twister. Uh, a PESCO project is one of the PESCO projects that aims at strengthening the ability of Europeans to better detect, track, and counter this threat through a combination of enhanced capability for space-based early warning and endo-atmospheric interceptors. It promotes the European self-standing ability to contribute to the NATO ballistic missile defense, and in this answering also a long-standing demand from NATO and the United States. The Twister project is the second missile system project to be supported under the new European defense agenda following the Beyond Line of Sight capability program, which became become part of PESCO in November 2018, just in the time I took over responsibility. The project involved three countries and aims at developing a, a European Union new generation medium 
range land battlefield missile system. The output is intended to be integrated on an extensive variety of platform, ground to ground, air to ground, and to provide integrated and autonomous target designation capability. The project also includes a joint training and four mass aspects. It is worth remembering that PESCO project and their ability to be found the true the European Defense Fund will only significantly improve military interoperability in Europe if the European member states make frequent, serious, and full use of them and integrate these tools into the national defense planning. We are many times asking for this aspect that is extremely important and is really member state driven. As everybody knows, uh, across Europe, we have different missile defense system. Just to name a few that are also the ones that are more uh, of interest of uh, the member state, Italy, uh, the SAMPT, developed through a cooperative program with France, and now in the new uh, nouvelle technology and next generation, the PAM resulting from cooperation with Paris and London, the surface anti-air missile extensive defense, some SD, used for uh, the European uh, multipurpose frigate. And finally, the common anti-air modular missile extended range, uh, CAMIAR, the famous CAMIAR, a system currently in the procurement phase. The issue is the perfect example of the importance of European Union common defense initiative and give me the possibility to stress some important points, if you allow me. First, the growing complexity of military capability planning and the establishment of recent capability initiatives, such as CARD, PESCO, and European Defense Fund, has led to recognize of the need of better align the European Union process with the NATO defense planning process, so the NBPP. Here we are at the second point, new impetus to European NATO strategic cooperation. In fact, according to the principle of the single set of forces, what is good for the European Union is also good for NATO. Massile defense capability is a surface planning example of how, at the same time, we can avoid possible duplication, optimize defense expenditure, and reinforce both organizations, European Union and NATO. Let me also say a few words on the paragraph that you rightly name the XS for under saga. We all know that uh, among alliance defense system, we have the Turkish S-400 that also risk to be just a standalone system, brought an enormous advantage to the Russian Federation, both in technical capabilities and in great embarrassment with the NATO. But the rules that Turkey is playing could be the topic for another entire uh, webinar. So coming back to European Union and NATO, I think that it is only through their relationship and not in contradiction to it, that the European Union may aspire to both achieve autonomy and to strengthen its own capabilities. In fact, while NATO exists to defend its members, most of which are European, from external attack focus on collective defense, the European Union has found this autonomous space play a concrete role in capacity building in helping countries to walk back on their leg using all the available tools. This is a reason why the European must be better equipped, trained and organized to contribute decisively to such collective effort. Coming to the third point, as also expressed by European Union political leadership, as European, we must learn the language of power in combination with soft power in a more integrated approach. Because, and we had known this for a while, I'm repeating it many times, no crisis can be solved with the pure military means, but no crisis can be solved without military means. And I conclude by highlighting that, uh, that in a security scenario characterized by an increasing number of crises, the security of our countries will depend on transatlantic relationship, which will remain central to European security and defense policy. Having this in mind, let me stress that European defense has become the main channel to develop robust defense capabilities and, of course, also in the missile defense sector. This is the reason why Member States will properly support and resolve European defense also in order 
to strengthen common vital interest. I hope that this keynote was uh, of interest. I thank you very much. And I will remain uh, for a while, but I'll, uh, in, uh, in 20 minutes or so, I will have to leave for another commitment. Thank you all uh, for this uh, opportunity. Many thanks indeed, uh, uh, General Graziano, for your keynote speech. You put uh, lots of relevant issues uh, on the table in a very frank way, in a very explicit way, which is uh, uh, very welcome uh, coming this view uh, from Brussels. Uh, let now begin with, uh, with the panel of speakers. Uh, each of them uh, authored a chapter in the EI study, Europe Missile Defense and Italy, Capabilities and Cooperation. Well, I mean, sadly, I have to say that one of the authors, uh, Mike Ellerman, has passed away on February at the age of 62. We interacted only via mail last year for this project, but since we are all persons beyond the mail, I just wanted to mention him and to say he did a really great job with us. Now let's come back to work. Uh, each speaker now is encouraged to make only few key points in order to leave room for the debate. For those participants keen to go deeper on the topic, the study is already available on the website, also because we presented to the Italian audience on April 7th through a webinar with the participation of Minister of Defense, uh, Lorenzo Guerini. Questions from the audience are absolutely welcome. And so please uh, use the Q&A function in the Zoom platform. I'm sure you're uh, well aware with the Zoom platform uh, now. And uh, I will collect them at the end of the, of the panels. Just please write a short question and name and surname. Uh, thanks. Um, let's start with the first speaker in our lineup, and I'm pleased to have with us uh, Douglas Barrier, Senior Fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Doug, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Alessandro. Uh, thanks to II for the kind invite, uh, and to you and to Carolina in particular for, for your work on the, on the volume. Uh, I'll keep my comments brief uh, related to my contribution. Um, missile defence has to be nested in the wider context of air or perhaps even airspace in missile defence. Uh, at, at the capability level, addressing missile defence wholly in isolation would be to miss the point, I think. Now, from a defender's perspective, it, it's an increasingly wicked problem. Uh, new technologies aren't replacing the old, but rather are providing complementary capabilities. Uh, defender's perspective, again, the target set is increasing and it's increasingly demanding. You know, on top of the traditional kind of air breathing target sets so the combat aircraft, if you like, um, the emerging threat environment ranges uh, in the foreseeable future from sort of Mach 10 plus hypersonic glide uh, vehicles uh, to maneuvering re-entry vehicles to depressed trajectory short range ballistic missiles to Mach 5 plus cruise missiles and to low, to low observable so subsonic cruise missiles and tactical air to surface missiles. Uh, and on top of that, you have uh, uninhabited aerial vehicles of all classes. Uh, so there's no shortage of challenge. And uh, uh, missile defense or air and missile defense or aerospace and missile defense obviously went through a period of benign neglect in the 1990s and into the 2000s. Really, there was very little threat to be addressed. However, today the state level threats becoming far more stressing. Uh, and there's also uh, an emerging non-state actor challenge. As an example, you need, uh, you need to look no further than the Houthi uh, with ballistic missiles, cruise systems uh, and UAVs uh, all used against uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, again, obviously the Houthi were, uh, uh, were and are supported by a, a state level backer. Uh, the Quds cruise missile, which has been used successfully, lacks terminal guidance. Uh, the Kuds one probably has a range of about 700 kilometers. Um, there's a follow on the Kuds two, probably more range. It uses only GPS and inertial, but it was more than adequate to hit uh, South, Saudi oil infrastructure. Uh, and again, Europe again faces a, you know, a, a, a renewed uh, surface to surface threat, nuclear capable in, in Russia's 9M729, uh, perhaps better known as the RSSSC screwdriver to give it its US designation. And, and the cause of the US withdrawal from the, 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 the INF. 
Uh, and there remains in the European context uh, the risk of a wider introduction of this class of weapon. The, Ru the Russians probably have four brigades plus with that weapon deployed to some extent. And our basic question remains, what are you trying to defend against? What's your goal? Um, and is it credible in terms of capability and therefore in terms of the deterrence? And deterrence has already been mentioned. And I think there's a really, in really interesting issue for debate around the extent to which a, a kind of full-blown BMD is credible in the European context. You know, air and missile defence against a peer or near-peer competitor has never been easy, uh, and arguably it, it's, yet, it's becoming yet more demanding. Uh, but this shouldn't be an excuse for not stepping up to the test. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back to you, Alessandro. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for your uh, concise overview of, uh, uh, of the threat and of the technologies involved. And with now, with this, uh, I am glad uh, to give the floor to uh, Stéphane Delory, Senior Research Fellow, Fondation for Research Stratégique. Stéphane, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexandro. Uh, so I'm dealing with friends there. And uh, as you know, friends has a very paradoxical approach to missing defense. Uh, having expressed some reluctance in the endorsements of many uh, US initiatives, but being also one of the most invested country in Europe in the matter. Um, the paradox can easily be, easily can be uh, explained since French authorities perceive uh, missile defense could erode the very notion of nuclear deterrence, uh, which remains the cornerstone of the French perception of national sovereignty in, term, uh, sovereignty in terms of security, and which remains also a core element of NATO doctrine. Uh, moreover, the cost of an effective missile defense is such that France send, seek to confine its specific mission in order to avoid financing missile defense program at the expense of other critical problems. From a national perspective, missile defense was not a priority in the framework of French defense commitments, uh, which are rather wide and financially very demanding. And consequently, defining the mission and the scope of this mission have been a subject of our discussion between France and NATO allies. On the contrary, uh, France always perceived defense, uh, missile defense, as an extension of the air defense mission, uh, a conception that is now encapsulated. Moreover, French industries have a wide know-how in NATO programs, through European programs such as PAMT or something, but also through the development of its uh, national air defense architecture. French industry has built a real expertise as French authorities try to promote in NATO and outside NATO, offering alternative. Uh, France has also a very good understanding of the necessities of early warning, which is rather warning, which is rather unique in Europe, major program in this matter. Uh, nowadays, France remains an, an essential player in Europe, having launched a process of modernization of the SAMTE and the PAMS uh, through the development and acquisition of new generation of missiles and new radars. But uh, as I think, as General Gazzano uh, told it before, the most uh, interesting point is not there. Uh, since France and Europe clearly miss the development of uh, exoatmospheric interceptors and cannot sustain the development of apparent architectures, uh, on the contrary, French and European industries are rather, rather uh, well positioned on the endoatmospheric domain, notably on propulsion, infrared detection, and uh, in some space component. Currently, since the threat is evolving, passing from traditional ballistic missiles to maneuvering uh, missile and hypersonic missile operating in the atmosphere, there's clearly something to be done there. Uh, this is a domain where France and Europe have a real know-how and can actively uh, contribute to the definition of a uh, to deal with the threat. Uh, as it has been said, the Twister program, uh, which remain rather interests uh, for now, uh, maybe a good opportunity for France, but also to Europe to catch up with the US uh, in the definition of these new architectures, uh, knowing that it will, as it has been said before, uh, heavy investments, but also political guidance to, uh, to uh, 
really is a critical question. And for once, Europe and France can offer some kind of rent. And I think I'm done because you ask us to be quite short. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for providing a snapshot on, uh, on the French uh, posture. Uh, as participants may see in the agenda, uh, we start from a, a general overview uh, by Douglas, uh, and then we entered into a number of uh, uh, case studies. So we begin uh, in, uh, with France, and now uh, we move to uh, the German uh, case study with uh, Torben Schutz, Research Fellow for Armament Policy at the German Council of Foreign Relations, uh, DGP. Torben, I'm glad to give you the floor. Thank you, Alessandro. Yeah. Uh, so the, the view from Germany on, on missile defense, um, and I want to, to present that view along three Ps, uh, as I call them. So the first one is perceptions, like threat perceptions. We know that technological developments are there, but you know, in order to, to result in political and military action, uh, they, they need to be perceived as such. And in Germany, the military perception of the both the armed forces, the Bundeswehr and the defense industry is um, up to date, I would say, regarding the, the threat um, of, of missiles, ballistic and, and crews and, and what, we, what we've heard um, by, by Douglas. Um, with both Russia um, as a re-emerged uh, threat and especially since the end of the INF Treaty, but the military establishment in Germany was quite unsuccessful in translating and communicating these threats to the political circles in, in, in Berlin, um, which is a risk for projects which in turn are designed to address those threats. So the political perception uh, in Berlin kind of takes the threat seriously, but is not really clear on how to address it. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is very strong in uh, engaged in, in arms control measures um, designed to address this, um, in particular, hypersonic uh, missiles. But, you know, addressing this with um, armament programs and militarily, that is more or less limited to the Ministry of Defense and the Defense Minister uh, herself in Berlin. The political debate is, is rather overtaken by unmanned aerial vehicles, especially after the Nagano-Karabakh conflict last autumn. And in the wake of this conflict, the Ministry of Defense um, started a comprehensive review of Bundeswehr air defense capabilities, which resulted in you know, a greater focus on short, short range air defense and counter UAV measures with missile defense fading into the background, so to speak. Second P, projects. In the, in the land domain, the Patriot missile systems in Germany will remain the backbone of its medium to long range air defense. The tactical air defense uh, system TL4S, you have heard about and, and Alessandro, I think mentioned it with regards to the like, most likely competitor meets is essentially dead no one so far no one in berlin wants to take the blame for killing it so but i mean it, it's it's dead period um so the the focus in the german air defense um and land domain will remain on, on short and counter uav possibly a bit counter uh, ram for the next years filling a capability gap um that exists in the maritime domain, um, Germany will wants to actually improve uh, its its uh, missile defense systems, upping it from three Saxon class air defense frigates, which we have now, to plans for six next generation air defense frigates uh, from 2032 onwards. But you know, that's more than 10 years, so no one has uh, talked about money yet. So take it with a grain of salt. I would I would say. And these future generation uh, air defense frigates would even consider introducing capabilities so far unknown in Germany, uh, for example, exo-atmospheric intercept capabilities, somewhere down the 2030s. Third P, prognosis. I, I would say that it is likely that Germany's focus in air defense will remain on, on short and counter UAV not much on missile defense, especially in the land domain beyond the already provided capabilities by, by Patriot, um, because 
you know, of three reasons that focus um, feeds into nat immediate NATO requirements for the VGTF in 2023. Um, counter UAV capabilities feed directly into the current uh, heated debate in Germany about uh, drones and armed drones. And that is just a good selling point as compared to more abstract threats by, by missiles. And lastly, it also fits better into the defense industry capabilities in Germany, which can provide you know, short range air defense from vehicle to effector, which is not the case for medium to long term missile or range um, and, and you know, more complicated missile defense, um, where Germany is, is quite dependent on, on US suppliers in, in some elements. And with that, I, I want to close. Thanks. Thank you, Torben. Thank you for uh, encapsulating the complex uh, German landscape uh, in only uh, three P's. And now I'm glad to give uh, uh, the floor to Carolina Muti, researcher in the security and in the defense programs uh, at TI, who uh, co-edited with me uh, the whole study and uh, authored uh, two chapters. Carolina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessandro. So I will start uh, with Italy and then I will uh, switch quickly to Poland. Uh, well, in the Italian case, the Air Force is responsible for control and defense of the national airspace through the Air Operational Command in uh, the northern city of uh, Poggio Renatico. However, um, the paradox is that uh, the actual AMD capabilities are distributed among various services. And Air Forces has a gap uh, in the capabilities that it manages because the majority of uh, systems are managed by the Army, like in the case of SAMSI, or by the Navy, like in the case of SAMS or SAM. Uh, so uh, this, of course, creates a situation of fragmentation and uh, of a more complex chain of command uh, we, 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 which is challenging. Uh, it is worth noticing that uh, most of the programs uh, are developed in cooperation with France and also with the UK. So uh, I won't go into detail. They were already mentioned by General Graziano uh, and by previous speakers. These are, these are mostly surface-to-air missile defense systems like SAMS, SAMS, also CAMER. Uh, which sees co uh, co cooperative programs uh, under OCAR framework um, uh, in some cases. Uh, in the case of the SAMT, uh, this is the SAMT is the only uh, Italian capability which has limited BMD um, uh, capability uh, in this moment. And uh, if we go to the uh, NATO and EU dimension, uh, it is worth recalling that uh, Italy is the, one of the most active allies uh, in NATO missions, but also EU missions and UN missions, in terms of personnel, first of all. And this, of course, um, exposes Italian uh, armed forces to uh, challenging uh, theaters such as in Libya or Iraq, uh, where and, and the political value of theater force protection and tactical AMD uh, increases, of course. Um, uh, secondly, uh, Italy hosts uh, US tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, so this creates a context where um, non-state and end state actors uh, could uh, attack uh, Italian territory. Uh, Italy is also a validating nation of the new command and control architecture uh, by NATO uh, and uh, in Poggio Renatico, where it hosts NATO deployable air command and control center. Uh, and uh, it is among uh, the first alliance to being uh, to, to, to uh, being able to, to, to validate. As, it, as was already mentioned, uh, Italy participates to the Twister uh, program, uh, to the Twister pro program that was already mentioned. Uh, now I will move north uh, and present the Polish chapter. 
in the case of Poland, of course, the situation uh, is, is, is well known. Uh, Poland uh, is neighboring with, the la with Russia, which has the largest inventory of ballistic and cruise missiles and is very active in developing uh, uh, hypersonic systems, test firing them. Uh, test firing anti-satellite systems, so uh, it is a very uh, challenging uh, geo geostrategic position, let, let, let's say. Uh, in this context, uh, it is not a surprise that IMD is a key uh, investment pr priority for Poland. Uh, also because currently the systems in use are Soviet-era obsolete systems which are not effective uh, on the battlefield. So the plans are very ambitious for the uh, for a layered structure uh, architecture of uh, AMD, um, starting with a uh, uh, short and then short and MRI uh, programs. Uh, in these uh, programs, uh, Poland uh, looks for a cooperation with the United States, first of all, especially in the VISWA program, with, which is the mid-range uh, missile air defense uh, system, uh, which uh, will be the most uh, expensive and, and, and the biggest one, probably. Um, on the NAREF program, uh, the, there is space for more cooperation, maybe with EU partners. However, this is also remains to, to be seen. Uh, and uh, if we pass to the uh, European and NATO dimension, the most important thing to mention is the Aegis Ashore Missile Defense System, which is a land-based system which, with, with exoatmospheric interceptors which should defend uh, uh, against short to mid-range uh, ballistic missiles. The Aegis uh, system is the contribution by the United States to NATO ballistic missile defense, and this is the third phase of the enhanced adaptive approach that U.S. Um, uh, contributes to, to uh, the protection of, of European uh, territory. Uh, so uh, to conclude, these are very ambitious plans by Poland, but uh, there are of course some challenges since uh, these are complex uh, programs and uh, most of them uh, are already delayed uh, due to negotiations, also offset agreements, licenses, or due, uh, or due to the COVID pandemics, which could have also an uh, uh, impact on the budgets uh, that are for now, they are, they're, they're, they're stay high, uh, but but it couldn't be it could not be the case in the future. And also because of the already mentioned by General Camporini, um, possible uh, threat perceived by by Russia uh, from from uh, uh, Poland because of this of these systems, and of course by the U.S. And here I uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina, and thank you for being uh, uh, dual capable and able to cover both Italy and uh, and, uh, and Poland in a, in, in a few minutes. And now I'm very uh, pleased uh, to give the floor to uh, Kan Kasapoglu, Director of Security and Defense Studies Program at the Center for Economics and Foreign Policy Studies, Adam, and we are, we are very happy to have uh, an analysis of the Turkish reality by a person very familiar with this reality and very knowledge knowledgeable. Khan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, and I'd like to extend special thanks to all the colleagues and also IAI for organizing such a timely event. Well, in a nutshell, what I'm going to talk about uh, as to Turkey's missile defense efforts and, and the strategic landscape in this regard is actually first the, the threat landscape that I'd like to bring to your uh, attentions. Uh, second, the Turkey's meaning for European missile defense, uh, European phase adaptive approach uh, and NATO missile defense efforts. And lastly, of course, the elephant in the room as 400 issue, of course, I, I would also be happy to answer questions, uh, which I'm sure that the audience will have. Well, as to the threat landscape, I can say that Turkey has the most problematic uh, missile uh, warfare threat landscape among all the allies. Uh, 
It is the only NATO nation that borders Iran, Iraq, Syria at the same time. Uh, to be, put it more, I think, strikingly, especially for European audiences, there was a decade, actually there were two and a half decades, that Turkey bordered Saddam al-Hussein, Hafiz al-Hassad, and Ayatollah Khomeini at the same time. Uh, nothing better can be asked for, maybe for, for a NATO nation. The Iran-Iraq war, which in essence was a missile warfare laboratory uh, for the 20th century, uh, happened right at uh, Turkey's doorstep. Uh, Turkey had to face two active uh, biological and chemical warfare programs, one from Iraq, one from Syria. The latter is still uh, continuing, according to many Western intelligences. Uh, and a rogue nuclear program, uh, which is still a threat, the Iranian nuclear program. So uh, when, when framing Turkey's threat landscape, we, we, we should always think about that problematic uh, security environment. Uh, there is one more uh, actually game changer, which I have to add this, this problematic uh, security landscape, which is North Korea. Uh, Turkey, in terms of missile defense and the uh, WMD issue, is bordering North Korea in the Middle East because the, the Syrian uh, missile uh, and WMD infrastructure, at the time the Iraqi uh, WMD and ballistic missile uh, infrastructure, and now the ir Iranian uh, proliferation efforts, actually has they all have a very important uh, North Korean touch, and the Pyongyang's uh, strategic uh, weapons technology uh, is pouring uh, at, at Turkey's uh, Middle Eastern uh, frontier. Uh, let me also remind you that uh, we tend to think uh, these capabilities in the framework of uh, Ali Hashimi Rafsanjani's poor man's atomic bomb uh, paradigm, uh, but the, the current uh, trends in the battlefield, uh, we extensively covered it with, with my friend and colleague uh, Stefan Dolleri during my time at uh, FRS, the Syrian missile launches, the Iranian missile launches during the Syrian civil war, and the Syrian Arab army's uh, extensive use of uh, chemical warfare agents show that in the eyes of these regimes, these are not the poor man's atomic bomb uh, strategic weapon systems, but they have a tactical value to be actually used uh, in an uh, ongoing uh, armed conflict. Uh, so Turkey, in, in terms of uh, threat landscape, is facing a very problematic, a very problematic national security calculus. And actually, uh, I think in the eyes of the Turkish elite, uh, this is a little bit despair and disappointment as to the West, because Estonia, back in 2007, uh, came under the Russian, the, the, the infamous Russian cyber offensive. Uh, and then uh, the, the small Baltic nation was turned into the alliance's uh, cyber defense capabilities. Uh, Turkey spent decades with this uh, problematic uh, threat landscape. And so its NATO allies still dragging their feet. Uh, when it comes to transferring uh, missile defense technology to Turkey, uh, cooperating or in, in terms of uh, co-production uh, ventures uh, with Turkey, and even the missile defense contingents uh, deployed to uh, the Turkish soil uh, due to the stemming uh, threat uh, from Syria, uh, were politicized revolving around the, the, the Kurdish-related issues. Uh, so again, like I'm, I'm not here to voice the, the official song, uh, but had another nation uh, came under such a threat uh, from the Middle Eastern uh, doorstep, uh, like Estonia, I could say that in the eyes of the Turkish elite, they would say that that nation, that hypothetical nation, would have eventually been turned into the missile defense hub uh, of, of NATO. Uh, secondly, uh, because of its geopolitical, uh, I think, unique uh, location, again, uh, Turkey uh, adds a lot of technical uh, pros to NATO's and European phase adaptive approaches uh, architecture. Uh, modeling uh, shows us that with and without the expand radar uh, in Malatya Kurecik, uh, all the uh, shore uh, interceptor systems planned and already, uh, already in place in uh, Poland and in Romania uh, would be different animals. So with and without Turkey, uh, the European uh, security and defense, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian missile proliferation approaches, uh, Iranian uh, missile proliferation uh, efforts, uh, would actually uh, reflect two different realities. Uh, and the, the, the other uh, very significant, uh, I think, connection here is the AWACS mission in Turkey. In terms of anti-terrorist uh, operations, uh, relocating that AWACS mission to 
some nearby countries like Greece uh, or Italy uh, can do something, but uh, thinking that we have very limited reaction time vis-a-vis -vis the ballistic missile threat, uh, the AWACS mission in Turkey in, in terms of augmenting that reaction time together with the expand radar uh, in Malatya Kurecik are two vital elements uh, for the uh, European uh, phase adaptive uh, approach. So without the Turkish unique uh, geolocation, uh, in the vicinity of the Middle Eastern uh, ballistic missile proliferation, uh, Europe would not be safe. Uh, the, the last point that I'd like to touch upon is the S-400 Sega. Uh, from a technical standpoint, that was something that I have objected uh, the Turkish acquisition. Still, I stand by uh, my position. I still stand with my position uh, that it was the incompatible uh, system with the Turkish uh, missile defense architecture. Uh, the Turkish Air Force have never ever been a some centric uh, doctrinal uh, order of battle. It never has had such a doctrinal order of battle. It is not the Syrian Arab Air Defense Forces. It is, it is not the Egyptian military. Uh, and just over one single sale, Almaz Ante was about to secure more than 13% of the Turkish weapons market. And as a consequence, Turkey is now out of the F-35 program, which brought a huge uh, techno-generational uh, burden on the Turkish Air Force. Uh, and uh, add to that also the Kaatsa sanctions, countering America's adversaries through sanctions act uh, sanctions uh, on Turkey's uh, shoulders. Uh, the only remaining option that can keep Turkey, which I'm going to stop here with, with, with two top provocative ideas. Uh, well, the first top provocative idea is that the only remaining option that can keep Turkey within the Western defense ecosystem is the European option, Perosa. Although much has been debated in Turkey as a comparison between Patriot uh, air and missile defense system, especially after the late 2018 offer, which was a lucrative offer, but very little uh, co-production options on the offsets and no tech transfer. And given the fact that we have the Kaatsa sanctions and this is an act and we don't uh, see any, uh, any turn from that in the foreseeable future, uh, the European option uh, remains the sole, uh, you know, anchor that can keep Turkey in the Western defense ecosystem. But here we have the uh, yet another, I think, the elephant in the room, which is the, which is the tense uh, Turkish-French relations, especially given uh, France's uh, way in, 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 the, in the Eurosum uh, calculus. Uh, and it remains to be seen whether Turkey and France can keep it transactional. That's an important point because Russia and Turkey were at odds in Karabakh. They are still at odds in Crimea. They are at odds in, in Syria. But the Russians were, uh, you know, manageable enough to compartmentalize these geopolitical uh, flashpoints and, and defense transactions with Turkey. Uh, likewise, Turkey and France are at odds in Libya and in many other frontiers, but it remains to be seen whether we can compartmentalize these issues in the Russian-Turkish way or not. And the second, uh, second uh, critical uh, actor here is Italy, because Italy is yet another actor, yet another stakeholder in, in the Eurosum uh, panorama, uh, if you like. Uh, and remains to be seen the Italian leverage uh, as to predicting the future of uh, Turkey's uh, say, uh, relations uh, with, with the European uh, ballistic missile defense uh, solutions. Last point, and I'm going to stop here, all the issues that we have been discussing, uh, the American Patriot offer Eurosum, whether we can keep Turkey within the Western defense ecosystem or not, the S-400, the S-400 filling uh, air defense or missile defense roles in Turkey, which is uh, very confused uh, among the Turkish strategic uh, community, I would say we would we would have been discussing none of them had Turkey not faced the 2001 uh, financial crisis because at the time Turkey and Israel were inch close uh, to secure uh, the co-production uh, of the Aero uh, missile defense system, which I think from a professional standpoint was the absolutely uh, fit system, absolutely suitable system for Turkey's missile defense needs because the Aero system is evolved uh, based on the SCAT base uh, threats uh, in, in the Middle East, which is the, which is the dominant, uh, actually, uh, th threat uh, item that, that we see. Uh, plus, uh, the Israelis, like the North Koreans, uh, they are all Western actors, but compared to Europeans and Americans, they are much more generous as to sharing technology with Turkey. So I think the turning point in Turkey's missile defense journey is not the procurement of the S-400, is not the first 
uh, flirting and then the rupture with Eurosum or the, the, the deterioration in the Turkish-American relations. I think in the beginning of the very 2000s, it is the, the rupture in the, in the Euro deal and then the deterioration in the Turkish-Israeli ties. I think we, with that happening, we would have uh, seen a very different Turkish uh, weapons landscape and a different uh, political orientation right now. Thank you. Many thanks, Khan. Many thanks for, for giving us such a, uh, a rich context and, and understanding of, on the, of the uh, complex uh, Turkish uh, landscape. Now uh, we move uh, north and uh, northwest, northwest in Europe towards the uh, UK situation. And I'm glad to give the floor to Siddharth Kausal, research fellow from the Royal United Service Institute. Rusi, Siddharth, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Alessandra, and uh, thank you all for being here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I'm just going to briefly summarize the content of my chapter on the UK's approach to missile defense. And really, the top line theme that runs through the UK's approach has been a sort of ambivalence, hedging, and, a and the idea of missile defense as a, a task to be conducted at an alliance level. So let's begin with ambivalence. Uh, really, at the uh, Britain being the first country to come under ballistic missile attack during uh, the Second World War has often shown a sensitivity to the potential value of missile defense. However, it has generally been an assumption of British policymakers during the Cold War that there were significant limitations to the feasibility of missile defense against the Soviet arsenal, and that this arsenal was, of course, to be deterred by the UK's nuclear deterrent in any case. After the Cold War, the inclusion of the rogue state threat did not really change this calculus because the assumption was that long range strike capabilities were an inefficient way of delivering conventional payloads. And if they posed a WMD threat, this was a threat to be dealt with proactively rather than reactively. Indeed, one senior policymaker in the 1990s uh, described you know, missile defense as creating the risk of a so-called Maginot mentality. However, Britain has never completely abandoned the possibility of missile defense being part of its repertoire and has hedged against the possibility that at some point it might want to participate in an alliance framework to this end. Uh, during the Cold War, this involved things like setting up the ultra high frequency radar at RAF filing deals, an important part of the United States' early warning system, as well as technical exchanges uh, at, as part of the Reagan administration's uh, SDI initiative, although it stopped well short of the uh, full scale participation offered to it and other European partners by uh, Caspar Weinberger. Similarly, in the post Cold War era, Britain has done things like upgrading the radar at filing deals. It has been a significant contributor to NATO's missile defense system, uh, that is to things like the alt bmd C2 framework and the costs of uh, NATO missile defense capabilities. Uh, but it stopped shy of both developing significant BMD capabilities of its own, as well as uh, stopping shy of any meaningful participation in uh, US-led programs such as you know, the Bush administration's uh, GPALS framework. In 2015, we see a slight shift from this policy, albeit a momentary one, where the Strategic Defense and Security Review published that year discussed the inclusion of a ballistic missile defense capability aboard the Type 45, as well as the creation of a UK-owned ground-based BMD radar that would contribute to the UK's uh, ballistic missile uh, and to NATO's ballistic missile defense coverage. Uh, the the uh, discussion of the Type 45 in a BMD role uh, reflected both homeland concerns, but also a growing awareness of the uh, tactical operational threat posed by things like anti-ship ballistic missiles and the discussion of a BMD radar reflected perhaps a, a, a partial shift from the UK's a historic ambivalence on the subject of BMD. However, the recent integrated review, which, uh, which the uh, government has uh, published uh, last month, has uh, more or less walked back on both of these commit uh, on both of these uh, sort of priorities. So uh, the UK will uh, no longer be exploring a, a BMD role for the Type 45 and, and the ground-based uh, radar appears to have uh, dropped from policy discussions as well. So what we're left with is a British policy which in many ways has reverted 
committed to a sort of historical posture of ambivalence, but also contributing to allied efforts at uh, developing missile defense capabilities as a hedge against the possibility that the UK might at some point go this way. So much of the uh, actual sovereign capability the UK owns in this area, which is coordinated by the Army's 7th Air Defense Group, uh, is in the form, uh, at least in terms of uh, ground-based uh, air defenses, uh, is in the form of cruise missile defense systems. Similarly, the Royal Navy's uh, Type 45 um, destroyers are capable of playing a cruise missile defense role. Uh, additionally, Britain can provide soft capabilities to alliance level efforts during exercise Exercises like Formidable Shield, for example, the annual NATO BMD exercise, uh, the Type 45 demonstrated its capacity for simultaneous air uh, for the tracking of a ballistic target, so as to ensure to enable a launch on remote by uh, an asset holding an interceptor. So Britain uh, is capable of providing some of the soft capabilities, the non-kinetic capabilities, to an alliance level BMD effort. Uh, the Missile Defence Centre within the UK uh, continues uh, to work with industry partners on tasks such as the develop, uh, such as war gaming and simulation, uh, the de uh, with which it uh, conducts with the entities, uh, uh, private sector entities like Kinetic, uh, the creation of uh, algorithms to enable simultaneous air and missile defense, which uh, MBDA UK uh, conducts in collaboration with uh, partners in in, uh, in the continent in Italy and France, as well as uh, some of the air, as well as uh, joint endeavors on the air on the air defense systems that. That, uh, General Graziani mentioned. Uh, so, in a, so it does keep, uh, you might say, a foot in this world. However, generally speaking, its con contributions are to what, on what you might say the soft side of the missile defense capability in terms of sensor coverage and software, as opposed to developing a sovereign so it's, uh, sort of UK-owned capability incorporating things like hit-to-kill interceptors. So the, the summary, really, of my chapter is that UK policy, it represents a, a sort of a continuation of a, a broad strategy to as missile defense of uh, ambivalence and hedging. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth, from this uh, uh, portrait of uh, UK ambivalence from, from your uh, very inside point, uh, point of view in London. Um, let me remind the participants that uh, questions uh, are welcome. I already got uh, uh, four questions, but we have uh, uh, room for others uh, after we hand uh, with the panel. So please uh, feel free to use uh, the uh, Q&A function in the Zoom uh, platform. And now uh, we cross the Atlantic and uh, uh, I'm really glad also to have uh, a view uh, from the US on this topic, given the, the crucial importance of the country for Europe's missile defense. And indeed you may notice the nuance about Europe's missile defense and not European missile defense. So with this, I'm glad to give the floor to Ian Williams, a senior fellow in the International Security Program Center for the Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and, um, and good afternoon to, uh, to those in Europe and, and good morning to anyone tuning in from, uh, from the United States or, or North America. Um, I'd really like to thank Alessandro and Caroline for including me uh, in this important project. Um, you know, as many of my uh, fellow panelists have, have said, you know, the role for missile defense within NATO has, has really grown over the past number of years, both from a policy standpoint, but also uh, capabilities. You know, for its part, uh, the United States has been, I think, pretty instrumental in, in establishing a continental defense, a kind of a baseline, a continental defense for Europe against, um, against a limited ballistic missile attack. Um, which we have through the permanent basing of, of the four Aegis BMD destroyers in Spain and uh, the Aegis Ashore site in Romania and, the, and the, the, the coming soon Aegis Ashore site in Poland, as well as the Tipi 2 X band radar in Turkey. Um, you know, and just to echo Dr. Kasapoglu, I, I, I have done some of the modeling that he is referring to, and I, I really I can't overstate just how important the placement of that radar in Turkey is to, uh, to ensuring that, that the Aegis Ashore sites work as, as advertised. Um, but you know, missile defense architectures all have limitations and trade-offs. Um, they uh, must be 
uh, generally, you know, quite specifically tailored to the adversaries and the threats that we choose to defend against. And uh, through that tailoring process, we can make our defenses, uh, unfortunately, some, in some counts, cases, less capable or even useless in a different context. Um, you know, for example, the EPA deployments are very much tailored to the ballistic missile threat from, from Iran. Um, you know, assets based in the Mediterranean, in Turkey, Southeastern Europe, um, uh, you know, but by narrowly tailoring the EPA towards the Iranian ballistic missile threat, you know, I believe it has, has limited its usefulness against, um, against other uh, threats emanating from, from other places. For example, uh, the Aegis of shore sites, you know, I would contend um, would have very limited to no utility in uh, the NATO-Russia uh, context, in a NATO-Russia conflict. There are many reasons why. The short version is that they are, they are fixed and unhardened, which makes them vulnerable. And they're also not multi-mission. Um, for example, these Aegis of Shore sites are equipped with standard missile threes, which can only operate in the vacuum of space. This makes them um, good for shooting down medium intermediate range ballistic missiles, which spend a lot of their flight in, 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 in suborbit, but makes them unable to counter atmospheric threats, things like cruise missiles, uh, even depressed trajectory short range ballistic missiles like the Iskander, which only enter space briefly during their flight. Um, and it is these sorts of lower tier threats that I think we're most concerned about when it comes to Russia. Um, you know, we don't really expect Russia to be sending long range ballistic missiles into Europe. Right? What we expect is if a conflict were to happen, um, it, you know, it would be more localized, uh, more localized conflict in an area where Russia could muster an advantage, such as a local conflict on NATO's eastern flank. Um, you know, in such a scenario, we would expect to see Russia, uh, or we could expect to see Russia engage in complex attacks using cruise missiles, drones, artillery, short range ballistics uh, in, in, in combination. So as we, as we further kind of open up the aperture of missile defense for NATO, you know, I would argue um, moving forward, we, we should pursue, I think, a rather different um, architecture and capabilities than what we did in the EPAA context. Um, for example, in some ways, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a smaller problem. In some ways, I, you know, I don't believe that we would need uh, a full territorial coverage um, against a, a Russian uh, missile, air missile threat, uh, but rather have defenses that are more focused um, to defend you know, vital military assets and, and key critical infrastructure. Um, you know, one thing we do need to worry about with Russia that we don't, that we didn't in the case of Iran um, is, is resiliency against attack. Um, you know, we have to assume that uh, in a, in a NATO-Russia uh, conflict that defensive systems themselves will come under attack. So they would need to be able to survive such attacks. Um, there's many avenues for achieving this, uh, achieving this kind of resiliency uh, mobility, hardening, uh, countermeasures, electronic countermeasures, um, and also active defenses, right? At either having multi-mission systems that are able to defend themselves or co-located with other with uh, multiple systems that can, um, in fact, defend each other. We see this, this is a fairly common way of, um, you know, we see, for example, Russia doing this. If you look at Russia's S-400 deployments, rarely are these deployed by themselves. They're always deployed in combination with other lower tier air defenses that can protect them from, from lower tier aerial threats. Um, and, and finally, I think we really need to emphasize multi-mission systems moving forward. Um, you know, the spectrum of air uh, and missile threats is, has really grown too varied and complex for single mission systems, um, like we see with the Aegis of Shore sites. So looking to, uh, to counter a potential adversary such as Russia, I think it's important to wherever possible have a layered defense um, around critical assets that can handle a wider range of threat types, be they cruise missiles, drones, ballistic missiles. Um, simply, this may be simply by mixing and matching upper and lower tier types of defensive systems, um, but, uh, uh, but also you know, emphasizing new capabilities like multi-mission interceptors and, and multi-mission launchers, right? Um, in some ways, I think we can learn a lot from, from the Aegis combat system more broadly, which has uh, elements like the standard missile six, which has both an air defense and a ballistic missile defense capability. 
um, uh, systems like, you know, the PAC-3, for example, which has uh, cruise missile defense capability, air defense, as well as a ballistic missile defense uh, capability. Um, but I think, you know, single mission systems that are, uh, you know, systems, you know, like, a, you know, the THAAD system, for example, is, is very good at shooting down, um, uh, you know, medium, intermediate range ballistic missiles in a certain part of their flight, but, you know, relatively little else without, without further adaptation. So I think, you know, moving forward, we need to really emphasize flexible multi-mission systems. Of course, the aim of these kinds of capabilities would be to complicate Russian military planning, not provide a whole complete impenetrable defense, but to complicate Russian military planning enough to discourage aggression against uh, NATO member states in, in, in the East and uh, could therefore have a, a rather, I think, these, uh, stabilizing effect on, um, in the strategic environment. And um, so I will leave it there and uh, look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. And uh, that, that was really an important uh, view from, uh, from Washington. Um, now I'm very pleased to give the floor to Federica Dallarche, researcher in the Multilateralism and Global Governance Program at EI. And I have to say that uh, on purpose, uh, we wanted to uh, have uh, her expertise on arms control and on proliferation because we think it's a very uh, important and complementary view with respect on, uh, of, uh, of the other views on the military, industrial, technological and political aspects. So she uh, co-authored one of the chapters of the study and uh, Federica, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Alessandro. I'm very glad to be here and very, very grateful for the opportunity. Before I begin, I actually would like to give credit to my colleague Ottavia Credi, who is there with you, Alessandro. She co-authored the chapter with me. So in giving this presentation, I'm also um, I'm presenting also on her behalf today. So as you correctly said, the aim of our chapter was a little bit different. Uh, we didn't express any national position, but rather our goal was to give a very objective um, list or guide, if you will, of the treaties in place um, to curb the proliferation of delivery systems and missiles. So in a way, let's say, we provided the other side of the coin or a um, um, complementary approach to show that missile defense is not the only option, if you will. And with that, I mean that um, I agree with what Dr. Richard Spare usually says, that missile non-proliferation and missile defense are directed against the same threat. So the threat is the same, which is um, missiles, but they act in, at very different times. So for the in the case of missile non-proliferation, we, um, we tend to uh, prevent an attack, right? Um, whereas with missile defense, uh, the, there's, a, there's an action that happens after a launch. So in this, with this context in, my, context in mind, um, approaches that countries are, some countries are pursuing um, complementary approaches. So uh, pursuing both approaches, if you will, at the same time is probably a very intelligent way to go. But what is missile non-proliferation? It's a series of diplomatic talks, arrangements, and instruments that aim to curb the proliferation of missiles. And more specifically, from a non-proliferation point of view, those delivery systems that are um, those systems that are enabling the deliver of weapons of mass destruction. Um, and this is an important clarification because, as you know, having uh, weapons of mass destruction doesn't necessarily mean uh, being able to deliver them or to hit the target or the enemy. So this chapter really looks at the major non-proliferation uh, multilateral bilateral efforts that uh, have been undertaken to discourage the diffusion of sensitive material and technology usable for um, delivery system and missiles programs. So Tavia and I have gone through a research exercise uh, that incorporated historical components 
and um, have tried to list the most relevant instruments to see what countries have done so far um, to prevent uh, potential attacks and missile threats. So you should really look at our chapter as a guide or a list of what's out there in terms of non-proliferation. Um, I was asked to talk about the main takeaways of our chapter, and probably one of the biggest one is that, unfortunately, uh, most of the instruments that are in place um, have a voluntarily, are on a voluntarily based and um, have not usually resulted in any legally binding international obligation against the proliferation of delivery systems. That being said, they serve or have served uh, in the past as very important transparency and confidence building measures among participating states, particularly in very critical times. Um, and this, I think, is very important and a very, ex a very important example of soft power, the same soft power that um, General Graziano was mentioning at the very beginning of this um, event. So with that in mind, um, Alessandro, I'll give the floor back to you. And I thank you once again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Federica, and thanks also, uh, Ottavia, for, for uh, the, the, the work on the chapter. Ottavia is sitting next to me, but at safety distance because of COVID, so you don't see her really next to me. So let's open the floor for questions. I have collected the four questions, which now I turn uh, to the speakers. The first one from uh, uh, Gustavo Scotti Duccio. The question is about uh, uh, the defense against hypersonic weapons requires the integration of multiple activities, but the speed of hypersonic missiles has changed the time for the reaction. And so what's the situation in terms of command and control of uh, uh, global networked command and control infrastructure? This is perhaps a question for, uh, for Doug. The second question, uh, by uh, Giacomo Cassano, ask uh, to elaborate more on the US role in uh, the European effort on missile defense. If I may interpret this question, I would uh, ask to, to Ian uh, if there is any uh, voice or position or concern in Washington about greater uh, European cooperation in military and industrial terms on missile defense. Third question uh, from uh, uh, Tom Sauer. He's wondering uh, how reliable are our current system for Europe missile defense? This issue has already been touched. Uh, he mentioned doubts on the Patriot performance in the Gulf War and asked, what is the success rate in exercises? Now, I'm not sure we have access or you panelists have access to the information, but any point from any speaker on the uh, testing, uh, readiness, effectiveness of missile uh, defense system is, is welcome. And we have a question from uh, Muhammad Kalem Uf Fateh. Uh, it, it's a thought-provoking question. Since uh, uh, security is deteriorating uh, in, in the regions surrounding Europe, and mainly in, in uh, Middle East and, um, and North Africa, and we have uh, threats from both state uh, Russia and others, and non-state actors, is it uh, is worth it to think about uh, um, deployment of missile defense capabilities to partners of NATO and not only to uh, NATO members? This is a, a tricky but worthy uh, question, and I will turn it uh, uh, perhaps to Khan. Any, if any of the other uh, speakers want to uh, jump in, is welcome. But I will uh, rather start with the question on uh, hypersonic and, and Doug. The floor is yours. Thanks, Alessandro. Um, yeah, the kind of there's a, obviously a whole issue around um, the compression of decision making uh, and how you manage that. I, I think it's inevitable you're going to see kind of um, greater automation. Um, uh, I won't use the word autonomy because I don't think yet we're at that point, but I think you'll see a, a substantial moves towards much greater uh, automation of the decision making cycle when it comes to high speed targets. At the national level, this is difficult enough. I think at an alliance level or, or, or a, a, a European level, it becomes uh, you know even more thorny because it requires uh, 
prior approval at the national level, which basically you're kind of ceding authority, um, not just to your own military, but to uh, an alliance military structure and uh, some elements of, 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 of automation. So it, it's not uh, it, it's not a simple thing to do, and I think there's a lot to be worked through before we get um, anything resembling a, a kind of coherent structure in that. Uh, just very briefly on the testing question, um, you know, real world testing uh, 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 of BM intercepts is fairly limited uh, for a number of reasons, um, some of which are understandable, uh, some of which arguably less so. Um, I think you'll see more use of synthetic testing. Um, that's good as far as it goes, but uh, it doesn't actually um, take or replace completely real world testing. And I think you, the issue in real world testing is that you almost certainly need to make the, the environments yet more stressing because in a real world conflict, obviously you're gonna be faced not by a, a single shot, you're gonna be faced by multiple shots and you may well be faced by multiple shots from, from numerous systems um, a, across the altitude and speed range, which would be very testing indeed. Uh, Alessandro, I'll be quiet and hand it back to you. Ian, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. I just want to uh, just adding on to the hypersonic uh, hypersonic question. You know, I think one of the you know the de the decompression of the of the uh, engagement timeline for those um, you know one of the avenues that the U.S. is looking at is uh, you know earlier detection and tracking. And if you look at uh, you know the United States is pursuing a space based sensor architecture that is specifically. Um, specifically aimed at, at being able to detect and track hypersonic glide vehicles earlier in their flight. Um, and I think that that would go a long way in, in, in terms of decompressing. So you're not waiting for these things to come over the, uh, you know, over the horizon before you can see them and, and react. Um, you know, th there is still the problem of, of target ambiguity because they can maneuver and they move not like a ballistic missile where you can pretty well determine where it's going to end up based on tracking it for a portion of its flight, you know. Um, so there is a target ambiguity there, but um, there is with an earlier, earlier tracking from space, um, you can at least get uh, to, 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 to have some, some kind of reaction, better reaction time than you would otherwise. And on the, on the testing, you know, I think a lot of folks will look at the 19, you know, they'll look back to the 90s and look, well, Patriot didn't do that well in the 90s. And, I think it's important to remember uh, that you know that that system that was deployed to Israel um, in that conflict was not is not the Patriot system that we have today. Um, that was a it was a that was a fundamental Pac One that was a an air really an air defense system designed to shoot down um, you know Soviet bombers and and um, and other aerial threats, not ballistic missiles. Um, that was that was repurposed um, in a pinch to provide a BMD capability because there was nothing else. After that conflict, um, you know, the, the U.S. Ballistic Missile Defense Organization took the Patriot and redesigned it to optimize it for, for, um, for BMD. And that's how we have the PAC-2 and PAC-3 uh, systems that are optimized. So it's not always a fair comparison to look at the performance of that um, in that context to the systems we have today. I think it's a better, it's a better comparison to look at, at least for Patriot, to look at what we're seeing, you know, the performance of Patriot in Saudi Arabia, which are they are using PAC-2 and PAC-3 um, systems against, um, you know, against ballistic missiles. So, and, and you know, from what we can tell, it's been they've been um, they've seen pretty decent success um, in encountering those threats with uh, with Patriot. So, thank you, Ian. Can your comments on the on the regional question? Thank you, and I, I, I think that's that's a really talk provocative one. Uh, I have three, I wouldn't say three answers, three dimension answer to that. Well, geopolitically, definitely, yes. Uh, we should consider extending ballistic missile defense uh, to our partners uh, because the threat is extending. Let me remind you very briefly, uh, what the, the Iranian Grand Ayatollah uh, Khamenei told right after the, the Aramco attack. He said when, when we were all discussing if it came from Iraq or it came from Yemen, 
uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said in, in, in right after in the Friday sermon, he said, if it came from South Yemen or it came from North Iraq, it came from Iran because Iran is in the North, Iran is in the South, Iran is everywhere. Uh, that's not a, an Iran skeptic or a Saudi figure talking. That that's the number one person in the Iranian regime is is talking right after the Aramco attack. Uh, there are other signs that that suggest that the threat is getting more geopolitical uh, complex. The Iranians are moving some of their missile infrastructure to to Syria. Uh, we saw time and again ballistic missiles emanating from Syria pouring into Turkish territory now in, into the into the Israeli territory very recently uh, and actually take from a technical standpoint uh, the way that the Iranians or the Iranian proxies uh, executed the, the Aramco attack actually we had to anticipate it coming because that resembled that mimic uh, the conops the concepts of operations that we have been observing in Yemen using cruise missiles, ballistic missile threat, and, and uh, kamikaze drones, loitering munitions, uh, at the same time within the same uh, operational context. So in order to counter that threat, we have to extend uh, our capabilities to a broader uh, you know, geopolitical uh, axis. And I think that uh, in a bilateral fashion, I wouldn't say in a NATO transatlantic fashion, but in a bilateral fashion that has to uh, involve uh, partner nations. Uh, to do that, you know, we have to understand that naval base capabilities is not suitable for the region because we have a very narrow gap when it comes to maritime uh, base uh, interceptors and uh, sensors. Uh, plus, uh, looking at the Aramco attack and the, 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 the consequences of the Aramco attack, maybe the Polish way, uh, not the Turkish way, not the, the Swedish way, but the Polish way of uh, dealing with uh, missile defense procurement especially the, I mean the IBCS infrastructure as to the Patriot acquisition, uh, that would lead us to any sensor, multiple sensor, but any sensor and best shooter uh, architecture in missile defense uh, could be the, the, not the silver bullet solution, but the optimum uh, solution when it, it, it comes to uh, countering the threat. Uh, plus, and I'm gonna stop here, not only the, the missile defense architecture, but also, countering the uh, missile threat at its uh, source. Now we know that Israel is an operator of the F-35. Uh, United Arab Emirates will probably be the, the second Middle Eastern nation to uh, operate the, the, the aircraft. And Turkey, although it is excluded from the program, maybe a way back uh, can be found uh, between uh, Washington and Ankara. We know that the, the distributed uh, aperture system uh, of the F-35 Lightning II uh, enables with, with, with the right configuration munitions, enables uh, to intercept uh, ballistic missile tellers uh, before or uh, during the uh, boost phase. Uh, also the Turkish drone warfare uh, performance in Karabakh war against the Armenian transporter uh, erector launchers in the hands of the Azerbaijan defense forces also uh, offered some uh, promising window uh, in, in terms of the teller hunt, which was something during Saddam Hussein times. Uh, so the geopolitically, yes. Technically, we have to pinpoint what what we have to you know uh, deploy as as capability to partner nations. But the biggest question and million dollar question revolves around uh, politics. You know, uh, Turkish Saudi Arabian relations, uh, Turkish Emirati relations, uh, other actors within the NATO alliance that can complicate the situation. I think first we have to have a conversation about how to have a conversation, then to agree our disagreements, and then solve our our disagreements uh, to just narrow down everything to the geopolitical and technical sense. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Khan. Many thanks to all speakers. We have a second round of question. Uh, first question comes from uh, Iroaki Nakanishi, and I'm glad to have a, a question from an East Asia perception, I guess. Uh, the question is about uh, um, what about the possibilities of having a, a, a dialogue on strategic stability and on the impact of the, these new technologies, particularly a personic missile of strategic stabilities in the Korean Peninsula and involving uh, both uh, um, US, Europeans, uh, Russia and China in this regard. That's, uh, you know, we, we jump from Middle East to East Asia and perhaps uh, um, Ian could answer this question and Federica also from an, uh, his point of view uh, 
Uh, and the second question is from uh, Laura Andres Seppi, and it's specifically about uh, the European Union role, current and possible role uh, on the talks about uh, the Korean Peninsula and the talks with North Korea. And since uh, uh, Yai is partner of the EU Non-Proliferation Consortium, uh, maybe this is again a question for, uh, uh, for Federica. Another question is about Italy. It's about uh, uh, which are the uh, missile defense capabilities Italy is uh, investing more, is prioritizing in its investment. And I will turn this uh, uh, question to Carolina. And finally, I would uh, uh, take advantage of my position as moderator to make a question to, to all panels, uh, and particularly to, uh, to Stefan, to Torben, uh, to Siddharth, who have not uh, got other uh, questions. In the meanwhile, uh, my question is, uh, uh, from the study, at least one of the conclusions uh, we as editors uh, draw from the study is that uh, the European Union is increasingly favoring uh, cooperation on capability development through PESCO, the Twister project, but also uh, in the future with European Defense Fund. Uh, and this European capability development cooperation will be integrated in the NATO architecture, in the NATO integrated air missile defense responsible for collective defense and for the operational deployment. So do you think this is a uh, a good example of uh, uh, NATO EU cooperation and on the uh, division of labor between uh, the two institutional frameworks. Uh, let's start with uh, with North Korea and end up with uh, NATO EU uh, cooperation. Uh, Ian, Federica. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll just in terms of the you know the the question of hypersonics and um, you know I think the general concern in regards to strategic stability and hypersonic weapons is. Um, it, you know, is that, you know, they're, they're hard to see uh, until it's until they're on top of you. It's hard to know where they're going. Um, you may not, you know, so the, the concern is, I think that they could be used as, you know, as a means to, to, um, to attack, you know, adversary military forces early in a conflict and, and this, you know, essentially neutralize, you know, for example, the United States, right? We have in, in, in Asia, in Asia Pacific, we have these bastions of military power around, uh, you know, relatively few, you know, Guam and, um, and Okinawa. And, you know, much of the US military power is based there. And if they, those few places can be taken out in a, in a surprise attack, um, then, you know, th that vulnerability would make the conflict more likely. China might be more, um, might be more inclined to start a conflict if they feel like they could do that in a, you know, in a crisis, if they could effectively disarm the United States or, or, or throw the US forces in the region into disarray early in a conflict. And that's the concern about, I think, with hypersonic weapons. So, um, so in terms of, you know, regaining strategic stability, you know, in doing, you know, how you would, I guess, accomplish that, you know, what steps diplomatically could you take to, to minimize those risks is, is, a, is a good question, other than limitations on hypersonic weapons um, uh, you know, which, you know, it's, it's always a challenge with China because China has no history of, of, of arms control. So it would be a new thing for, for them to do that. And so there's a lot of challenges to getting, to dealing with these, um, to dealing with uh, the, the, you know, destabilizing effects of, of these weapons uh, you know, through diplomacy alone. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll let Frederica, I think, answer that, that side of things. Many thanks, Ian, and thank you, Alessandro, and our participants for the questions. Um, with regards to talks about arms control um, and the potential role of the EU, um, well, what, also, actually, thank you, Alessandro, for mentioning the EU Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium that on these topics and on the DPRK and um, the GCPOA also is trying to do quite a lot. Um, with regards to the European role uh, in, um, in, the, in the situation of the Korean Peninsula, well, let's, let's not forget that, for instance, Federica Mogherini in her capacity of high representative was actually um, able to visit the DMZ 
and um, actually tried to uh, create a role of bridge, bridge builder. Um, the, the Korean Peninsula especially is particularly complicated as everyone know. Um, as everyone knows, the, um, the DPRK doesn't really trust the United States and this is no uh, news, but the DPRK doesn't even uh, consider uh, South Korea as the eligible um, other side of the negotiator of the negotiation. Uh, so there's um, the, there's there's definitely a role that the EU could play in this sense, and which is um, the one of a bridge builder. The the European Union is trusted um, when um, when we uh, when the United States decided to pull out from the GCPOA. Um, the European Union has demonstrated commitment commitment towards the agreement. And this is something that definitely the DPRK has seen. Um, so in this context, uh, in the context in which the, um, there's a lack of trust between the parties and um, a lack of um, willingness to, uh, to go forward in a sense, um, I think the EU has a lot, a, a lot of margin for, for negotiation and for um, trying to uh, put together the pieces that haven't uh, worked too much in common for now, so far. Thank you, Federica. Carolina, a quick comment on Italy's priorities. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Well, uh, a quick comment. Um, I would start by saying that uh, AMD is not an Italian priority in terms of uh, investment. Uh, so uh, it is mentioned in the last multi-year planning document as an additional priority, let's say. Uh, this means that there is no dedicated uh, budget for programs that are mentioned. Uh, it is mentioned that Italy would need a, a system against ballistic missiles and hypersonic missiles, but there is no bad, bad for it uh, uh, in this moment. Uh, what is currently uh, undergoing is the modernization of arms, uh, including the integration of a new uh, effector uh, and also a new radar uh, from the Kronos family of Leonardo, an updated uh, command and control system. Uh, so uh, to, 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 uh, this is aimed to give a more uh, ballistic missile defense capability uh, to pumps. At the same time, uh, it was already mentioned that the Kammer uh, interceptor is being under development. So the contract was signed at the end of 2019 for the development phase. Uh, and the um, camera should reach supersonic speed and uh, um, be deployable also in environments uh, with heavy electromagnetic interference. So this is what's currently under, um, under development. But I would say that uh, despite the threats, it is not um, an area of priority uh, for, for, for Italy, unfortunately. Uh, on the uh, on the um, last question you you mentioned I uh, on Twister project I just want to add that the aim to contribute to the B, to the NATO BMD is something uh, clearly stated if you go to the uh, web page of Esco project and you read Twister um, contributing to NATO BMD uh, is something that is planned it will uh, it, it remains to be seen how it will work in practice. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Any any comment on my question about uh, NATO-EU cooperation and division of labor? Um, yeah, I could jump on that if uh, sure. Uh, uh, Sit so, back and then and then Stefan. Uh, yeah, so I, I think the key question when it comes to you know NATO-EU cooperation is how ex uh, you mentioned the concept of eventual integration with the NATO framework is exactly what we mean by integration it does it mean you know different platforms developed can be coordinated by a chaos or does it mean that they're able to communicate with each other on sort of any sensor best shooter principles like uh, dr kaspoglu mentioned because 
it's possible for a sort of a federated system uh, to be quite interoperable, which would have been fine for the threats of, you know, up to quite recently, but not quite integrated in the way they need to be in order to deal with the sort of the multi-tiered complex adversary salvos that a peer competitor can produce. So in many ways, uh, I, I think the criteria for what determines uh, an EU system that can be integrated with NATO, how we define that term integration is quite key to the question of whether it uh, becomes, whether the systems are sort of complementary or redundant. Thank you. Stefan? Uh, well, uh, my answer would be a bit uh, different because if you, if you talk about uh, modern architectures and future architectures, it's rather uh, complicated to uh, develop and rather demanding in terms of technology, but also in terms of investments. And so uh, currently, EU programs are perfectly insufficient to, to produce something, so you, you, you need to go far beyond that. And uh, in parallel, the US is currently uh, heavily financing and developing uh, its current system and its future system, and it's uh, in terms of billions of dollars year after year. And so uh, the, the main option is that the US will propose something which is workable and usable, and we'll have to compete to propose something which is also workable and usable and uh, which uh, have to uh, offer some good performances. And if you want to do something like that, you need the European state to finance and to, uh, to invest in those systems, knowing that they can't and knowing that they don't want. So uh, uh, what I was uh, telling before is that we, we have a chance to do something legal because we have the technology. And by the way, the US invests so much, that's true. The problem is that we don't have a chance in political terms because nobody in Europe wants to finance this kind of assets in uh, such levels that it would be unbearable. And so there is a clear problem. You can expect that we will do something. In fact, it's rather dubious that we get something in the end, uh, except a US system. And that's it. I give you the floor. Thank you, Stefan. Any other comment on, the, on, on this point? Torben, yes. I mean, ju just a short notice, you know, if I'm thinking like the easy way and, and a future European project or program or product, um, you know, plugged into the, the NATO, um, current NATO integrated defense system and missile defense. Um, I mean, on the one hand, it, it sounds like a, a great example for, for, you know, kind of Europe improving its own capabilities to improve NATO capabilities, but at the same time, it would be the perfect example for the EU being dependent on an you know, uh, overarching NATO system. So it's kind of um, it, it, a two-sided coin in a way, um, because it will also underline that um, European autonomy or whatever we want to call it uh, in that field would, would still be far off. And, I think Stefan is right that we probably don't have the financial, but no, the will to invest, invest sufficient resources and um, to truly really create another system. And so, um, yeah, it's a, even under circumstances of developing a European system and then integrating it into existing native frameworks, it would be two-sided coin. Just, yeah, my thought on that. Thank you. And thank you all for uh, your very uh, realistic uh, uh, replies and, and to take, uh, take the challenge of my question. Um, I got the last minute comment from Stefano Silvestri, a former EI president, and I'm going to briefly read because it's uh, thought provoking uh, as usual. So uh, Silvestri wrote, following Camporini's suggestion, it is essential to define clearly the aim of European missile defense program. The present NATO approach may increase our security from Iran, but it is provoking a stronger Russian reaction. In the end, is this NATO approach increasing or decreasing European security? I'll leave you with this uh, uh, thought-provoking comment. 
Um, many thanks to all speakers for sharing their thoughts and for engaging with the audience, engaging not in Air Force term, but uh, in a more diplomatic term. Uh, honestly, it would have been great to have uh, uh, the speakers in the AI uh, headquarters in Rome to present together this, this study. We could not make it, but I'm sure there will be other opportunities uh, uh, to meet in the future. Many thanks to the participants for their questions, or at least for their attention uh, over the last one hour and a half. And many thanks to the AI staff for uh, setting up uh, the, the event. So have a nice day and best wishes from Rome.